All right. Well, my name is Edward Miro, and I just have a few announcements before I introduce the next speaker. I just want to remind everyone who's taking part in the Diane Initiative today to check out the Red Team Village. I know they have separate talks going on over there, and there are raffles in each of the main tracks, so please sign up for those. If you're interested in learning about soldering and hardware work, there are badge workshops going on all day. And then one really awesome thing is they're having res resume review, pardon me, and mock interviews in the career village so please take advantage of all the extra stuff that's available I just want to thank a few of our sponsors uh, before we get started here uh, eLearn security Intel Remedian thank you very much uh, Amazon information security and Salesforce Verizon MongoDB and of course Microsoft uh, without these amazing sponsors supporting this event it just wouldn't happen in on the scale that it is and with these amazing speakers like I'm about to introduce here. So uh, to deliver her talk, testing all the things, we can't catch them all and who's accountable anyway, we have Sarah Clark. Uh, she's with BH Consulting and also does stuff via her own firm, Introspectives Limited. Uh, the talk is a little bit tight on time, so we may not have time for questions afterwards, but we are going to set up a breakout room for questions. And then you can, of course, reach out to them on Twitter at Trial by Truth or LinkedIn uh, slash infospective. So uh, thank you very much for being here, Sarah. And it's all you now. Hi. So absolutely delighted to have a chance to talk at um, Diana, Diana Initiative. I know a few of the organizers. And I, I wouldn't have made it unless this was virtual. So I, I'm, although I'm sad not to get to meet everybody in, pe in person, it's great that I get to do this. Um, just to let you know what I'm trying to do today, this is a little bit of a, a, a training-ish deck for a conference talk, because I wanted to give people some, some actual concrete stuff to take away. However, I'm not necessarily gonna share this recording. What I'm more likely to do is share the slides perhaps with some more context um, via my blog, but I will make sure that I keep the Diana Initiative guys um, posted about that. Um, how I got to the point of writing a talk like this is I've spent about 10 years doing governance, risk and compliance at small and large scale. And the thing that kept smacking me between the eyes was that, that there just weren't enough hours in the day. Um, we would cycle around time and time again with a list of change projects or a list of systems to assess or a list of vendors and we'd run out of time or we'd run out of time to either assess them or we would run out of time to fix stuff. That is exactly the same as when we would have a whole bunch of pen testing done. Uh, we'd get a whole bunch of vulnerabilities. And yes, we had a CVSS score, but we didn't really have the background information about the assets in terms of data and availability that were hanging off those things that were vulnerable to really prioritize what we fixed. So what I looked at is trying to find some way to prioritize stuff in a way that I could get the business to help me do. Because what you don't wanna do is spend all the expert time asking a bunch of basic questions that you have to keep asking again and again and again. And you also need to make sure that all the people who need to help you are accountable. So this is what I'm gonna be talking about today, trying to get all those people with skin in the game to fess up to the fact that's the case and trying to find simple ways to give them the information to give us the help we need to get our job done. So. With that said, just moving on, I mean, this is why we bother. I mean, I'm willing to bet that most of the people involved in our game and the adjacent game, I'm now mainly in data protection, it's because we wanna stop stuff going out into the wild and causing collateral damage. We want to make sure that some accountability is taken before that stuff goes live internally or to consumers. We wanna make sure that that's not gonna hurt people all the innovation needs a little bit of leave to bed in, a little bit of leave to see if it can work. Um, but we also want somebody to take responsibility to make space to, to fix stuff. Um, I mean, a massive accountability uh, fail is obviously the situation that happened at Equifax. Uh, how, how do we let the guy blame somebody for not patching? I mean, in what world is it not negligence um, to not have a chain of command in charge of working out where the patches need to have space to be deployed. We all know that sales and marketing say you can't possibly have downtime right now, but that is not how you get to play this when you're sitting in front of Congress. Anyway, you can tell that upsets me. You've got the massive stuff like um, Clearview AI just scooping up every image they can find and uh, Ancestry selling us, well, 
asking us to pay to give them our DNA. We all saw this coming. We all saw private equity firms coming to buy this. I mean, first it was um, GSK with 23andMe's trove of data, and it's not just the DNA data. A lot of that is close to anonymous, but you've also got um, all the phenotype data, all the questionnaires that people answer, which is arguably a lot more usable straight away for whatever purpose they want it. I mean, the fact that Clearview AI is now sending their stuff to ICE, let's put that on one side. Obviously, if you're working with firms who in those cases, their profit motive means they, they don't care about necessarily looking back at whether real consent was given, you can only nudge things to work in the right way until regulation and law catches up to give you a lever for making the right thing happen. But you can do your own job internally. Um, and that's what really we're focusing on today. What can you do? How do you recognize when perhaps you're not in a position where it's mature enough to let you do the right job? And then you've just got to decide whether you can stand to stay there or whether you have to move away. A-levels is the most recent one. I've got kids that are going to come up to exams in the UK in not too long. They put this stuff in. The guys in charge in Ofqual said, we didn't see the algorithm. We didn't look at the algorithm. We told them what we wanted it to do. And they told us it was going to be OK. Fine, then. That is an issue with due diligence. It's an issue with testing. It's, a, it's an issue generally with blind trust in technology. All of this is what I'm going to talk about us fixing. If you want to see, see the story of the Horizon IT scandal, that one will make your skin crawl. Have a look at my Trial by Truth Twitter feed. I had it pinned there. I'll put it back for you after this. But this is not going to be a surprise to anybody. Really, that, this is a place on the maturity curve. If, if people in the business believe that security and privacy is the specialist job, that they don't have any skin in the game, don't expect to make any progress anytime soon. They may be on the cusp of accepting that there's a competitive advantage to be had for building stuff better, for defaulting to being secure and privacy protective with what we design. But it does depend on the business model utterly and the size of the business, whether that's actually going to be something that you can change. And the point really is that you need to be able to give people enough information to be able to change their minds. And even if you have got people on board, oftentimes you don't stand a chance of testing all the things, of fixing all the things. I mean, it's usually an 80-20 thing. We will look at all of our big IT service providers. But are we looking at the people down the line? Are we looking at the people under procurement threshold? A lot of procurement teams in big businesses won't even poke hard at anything where they spend under 100K. And we've got a picture of containers there because that's the lists we tend to have. We tend to have our configuration management database or an asset register where we've got the type of tin, the type of operating system, perhaps what it links to. But we really, in most cases, don't have the kind of risk indicators that we all need to consistently work out when something is a priority to really get involved with kicking the tires. That's also going to be apparent in the worlds of sort of bug bounties research um, when we get into CVSS, when we've got a vulnerability. All you can do as somebody reporting that inbound is tell them how bad it could be, tell them how easy it is to exploit, tell them typically what people can do if they can compromise that on the kind of systems that are vulnerable. What you don't know unless they have got decently robust internal information is, is it handling lots of personal data? Is that, what's the throughput of that through that system? Is it secrets? Is it financial data? Um, is it just high availability for operations? That kind of um, mapped out network picture is, it may be fresh because they've done it recently, but it's very rarely well sustained. So I'm telling a tale of woe here. It does get better. So we've got people who think it's not their job. We've got too much to do. We've got not enough information to try and change people's minds. And then, excuse my attempt at um, amateur um, cartooning, but this is also the situation in a bigger business. We, we work in businesses who have boom bust cycles. You have a decently resourced team 
and you see something that's a bright idea. You think, right, okay, right, no, nope, I can fix this. I can get buy-in, I can get budget, I can make this change. And you find those stakeholders, you get everybody involved and they're buying into this. They understand that they have to help you get this sorted. And then there's a massive audit point or a breach or a pandemic or your sponsor decides to leave and takes the budget away. Or somebody comes in with a really bright idea and spends it on some quantum AI blockchain. And then suddenly all the stuff you were trying to do to get your turn the handle assessment of new stuff coming down the pipe, your assessment of stuff that's maybe still risky or regular cyclical tire kick in, or you've got no time to do your horizon scanning to see what threats are coming across the way. You haven't got time if you can't keep it rolling with that standardized regular stuff to then look at the things that don't perhaps have a well-defined control to keep on top of them the novel stuff that's actually the bit that's fun. And if people aren't paying attention, this is really what it boils down to. Accountability for risks has to be formally assigned. And people have to have the influence and knowledge to affect change. Sorry, it's skipping a slide. This one seems to have a timer on it. I haven't been able to remove. People have to stay accountable until processing ceases for the purpose or they hand it over to another role holder if they leave the firm and specialists us we have to give them enough information to make good decisions about whether to pay for a mediation or, or can they tolerate risk for an amount of time and we have to get them to remove blockages to us doing our job and all the stakeholders we identify as having a role to help us get things done they need to actually do that because in the end no one should be accountable for something that they can't influence or don't understand. Now, that last part sounds like utter common sense, but too often it's not what we're hearing every day. We're hearing, well, you know, I know you've got a lot of work, but we've got 17 change projects that are going live tomorrow, just get it done. I know you've got a lot of work, but you know, we've got 256 vulnerabilities. Why, why are they still there? Um, I know you've got a lot to do, but we've got 17 new suppliers and, you know, audit saying we, we should have got those assessed. So what do you do about that? How do you try and describe what the scale of the challenge is and try and prioritise what to do? Well, sorting that accountability piece and moving to the place where you can actually do your job. I've broken down into these four parts, actually working out whose job is what getting people to fess up to their part that they play um, de-scoping rather than scoping, because really the thing that we ha find hardest to defend is the bits we can't do. Too often we just start at the top of the list, work down and then try and scrabble around to explain why the stuff lower down the list is less risky, but we do it after the fact. Uh, doing it and documenting it, how can we do it in a way that doesn't kill us and actually works for the people we're asking to help us? And how do we keep it rolling time after time? So for that delegation piece, you can't delegate down to the help desk manager. He doesn't have the budget and he doesn't have no influence to get stuff done. He can't magic up a strategic change to um, the version of your operating system. He can't produce um, a testing environment for you if you haven't got one. He can't make those kind of changes if you're discovering them across lots of different change projects. There's these Swiss cheese holes in the foundations. Um, he also can't change the relationship with a supplier oftentimes. So you need to make sure you land it in the right place. And of course, responsibility spreads across the village and we need to treat the blockages we come across as risks just as much as the stuff with the percentage probability and dollar likelihood that we usually log. And then there's our third party estate. So who in the executive do we make responsible? You know, it, it doesn't matter. It really, really doesn't matter. It's who makes sense in your business. The same way that you try and put together an instant management playbook by sitting down with decent scenarios. I saw Daniel Carr just today, he posted about scenarios that he's put together that you can reuse for free. You sit down in a room and you explore what that means all the way through your supply chain and all the way through your internal management processes and you work out who 
has skin in that game. Sorry, I say that phrase a lot because it's so important to me to, to drive out. It's so much all of us as the answer. Um, but you do need executive level sponsorship to make those strategic changes. But it spreads across the rest of the business too. You know that. Um, and if the people who you're getting risk intelligence from, if the people who need to make space for you to do patching, if the people who need to facilitate the conversations with suppliers, if the people in procurement who've got half the information you need to start your vendor governance job, if the, the project management office aren't playing, it's not going to work. You also need um, to have your second and third line of defence on board. They need to understand what you do, how much it takes you to get your job done. And this is really circling back to that thing I just mentioned, that we've got the remediation risk. We spend all our time talking about how much money we're going to lose, who's going to get hurt, um, how long might we be down, how much it might hit our bottom line this quarter. That's the stuff that the board is most interested in. But the board can't skip being interested in the fact that those things are outstanding for longer and probably get more serious because we don't have the means to do our job. Those engagement risks, whether somebody's actually telling us about the projects coming down the pipe, whether somebody's telling us about the bright ideas before it goes live, whether somebody is telling us that they're thinking about engaging a supplier, whether someone's telling us that they've siphoned off some budget to play with the most bleeding edge thing they can get their hands on. Um, we need to log those risks and dependencies. And a lot of those are foreseeable. But you know, what are they? How do we drive out those things to then track? We do a racy. Now, everybody who just wants to get on with their job hates these things. I do not blame you. The screen you're looking at now, nice and busy, and like I say, I will change some things so you can sort of look at these things. This is this is in vendor governance kind of context. This is breaking down on the left hand side all the things we need to do our job the kind of inputs we need, the kind of escalation points we need, the people who do the different inputs into different stages of assessment, remediation, risk management. And then there's all the people along the top. Driving out those things is the value in this. The people you put in a room to have these conversations is the value in this. The fact that you record the constraints, assumptions, dependencies, risks and issues in their worlds too. Um, you go to someone in procurement and they say, well, do you know what? We can't service your need to find out about what's coming down the pipe and answering your first triage questions because they're just about to cut half our staff. And we're struggling to even do the bare minimum from a commercials point of view. OK, you find out if you're mature enough and if your people are actually there to enable you to do your job. It's not your risk if no one's going to tell you about the suppliers that are being engaged. It's not your risk if no one can answer your question so you can find out what the heck they're being engaged to do for you. This is all the kind of conversations you can have up front. Because let's face it, the later you escalate, the more it sounds like an excuse. It's a rare business that actually sees escalation as a positive and that's where we want to be. It's only seen as a negative because it's a surprise. You're landing stuff that's gone really badly wrong with people who oftentimes you're telling them that it's their job and it's the first they've heard of it. Um, what you need to do is drive out those kind of responsibilities, accountabilities, who is consulted, who is conformed, your RACI. So they know what's coming. You arrange meetings so that stuff can go into those forums. You drive out their blockages. You champion them to get the people they need to help you do your job. But how do you have those conversations? What kind of information do we really need to talk about risk to make a case for actually doing any of this work? Well, before we get on to that, we really need to acknowledge that third parties have a massive role to play. Now, there's both governing them when you bring them on board, but then there's the part that they inevitably play in so much of what you do as a business. I'm very, very aware that businesses more and more have a dependency on cloud vendors for utility applications like office suites, um, platforms as a service, uh, and then SaaS of all different flavors every day. And depending on how big you are, you're going to be able to do 
very little more than what they offer as a standard to give you information about controls and um, what kind of diligence they're performing on their downstream suppliers because we had, don't just have third parties with our fourth fifth and sixth parties too now i'm not going to be able to tell you a way to solve this i have more granular specific information about vendor governance i could share another day but i do just want to call out the fact that you should be as part of any contract being very careful about that demarcation and accountability for the governance piece you need to find out whether they're going to provide you with the information you need if they're going to provide you with an ISO 27001 certificate, is it just for controls in their canteen or is it actually for controls over the stuff that they do for you? Um, if they can't give you the transparency you need, it's a risk you need to raise and you need to know about it early enough to be able to raise it. So back to that question about how do you prioritize? What kind of levers do you use to work out what's the priority, what you can put in and out of scope? Well, we know you can't do it all. Um, you need to get questions answered at the earliest possible stage. You need to go back to your stakeholders. If you're asking the right questions, you can actually have conversations up front to say, how much is enough? How many do you want us to do of projects, software, assessments, system assessments? vendor assessments but you've got to document it all so it's that um, iceberg again what can you put out of scope immediately well why are you kicking the tires on oracle if they're just doing licensing procurement probably think they're important because you spend shed loads of money with them but from a privacy and security point of view probably not so much and then your actual utilities, again, you're getting a standard shape of service from those guys. If there's something specific for you, you need to assess it. But if they're never going to change it, even if you demand they do so, all you can do is change vendors, then why are you putting that as a priority? Why aren't you treating that as a different thing, a risk tolerance conversation? Same with payment service providers, Swift and Bax. You know, it, it, it may be a mess, but if there's only a couple of market service providers, again, that's a different conversation. You suck it up. Um, but for the rest, where they do do specific stuff for you and handle your valuable assets, then, you know, you need to get something done. And how do you work that out? How do you get through a big list of stuff? Well, you, you get honest about the questions that can put stuff in scope or out of scope, what you're aiming to do is ask the minimum amount of questions that can be answered at the earliest stages of coming up with a project concept or an idea to select a supplier. And you are asking things that are not going to put risky things out of scope. This, after a long time of working in this field and thinking about it, came down to three pots of killer questions. Data risk. Is it personal data? Is it secrets? Is it um, card data? Is it health data? Is it finance data? If it's not, do you care? Physical risk, are they coming on site? Are you going on theirs? Are you compromising your perimeter with something they're doing? If not, do you care? Availability risk. I mean, is it five nines availability? That's a no brainer. You're gonna really wanna check on that. But if it's less, if you, if you don't care, if it's not there for a week, Three, maybe five questions, those killer questions plus a couple that branch off them. There are very few things that need a priority tire kicking that fall through that net. You are going to catch pretty much everything you need in a first phase of priority activity. That's been tested, that's been proven. If it doesn't, you can add another question. Your estate, your, your business model might be different but it's a great place to start. Then you have some other questions. You know, you want to know the details of what kind of data. You want to know where it's happening in the world. You want to know what other kind of suppliers might be involved. Um, you want to know about remote access. What you don't want to know with these absolute and conditional criteria, the how much do we care questions, you do not want to start asking about controls. At this stage, we're still working out what kind of assessment we want to do. Do we want to do a privacy assessment? Do we want to do a vulnerability test? Do we want to do a pen test? Do we want to do red teaming with these guys? What's justified with what they do? So 
you are asking questions at this stage to work out, is it a whole shed load of inherent risk, shed loads of data, high availability, physical security? Is it going to need, um, which kind of main kind of tire kicking is it going to need? What kind of assessment? Who are you pointing at? Um, and where does it go on your priority list? Is it number one? Is it number two? Is it number three? Is it number four? That's what absolute and con conditional criteria do. And I'll talk more about those in just a moment. All you want to do is ask questions that allow you to escape, defer, delegate, or sometimes if it's a really big hairy deal, plug someone in. You want to embed someone in the Agile project because you need to catch stuff before it gets embedded in designs and the budget's been spent on doing it a really ropey way. And then you get on to the more familiar focus for everybody, which is actually doing the assessment, working out what risks left when you see if the controls have gone in right after the fact. And if it isn't, you need to be able to plan the remediation while somebody's still got some money to spend on it. But how do you, how, what does that look in pra like in practice? That looks like a, no more than a 15 minute questionnaire, ideally in survey format where it's branched. You don't ask anybody any questions that aren't relevant to them. You need to make it pleasurable to answer. That might sound stupid, but the more times that people say, actually, that's not too bad. That's only 15 minutes out of my day. Worst case scenario, 30 if I'm doing something that ticks all the risk boxes. You need to make it um, standardized. You shouldn't be asking anything that's nice to know at this stage. You need to beat people off with a stick who think, oh, this context would be nice and that context would be nice. No, if it's not about prioritizing based on risk, if it's not about delegating to a specific team and it's not about what needs to go into contracts, etc., you're not asking it right now. You can ask it next. If it's really needing the tires kicked, you get lots of time to get to know them later. And we're not asking about percentage, probability, and dollars impact. We're not asking about C, I, and A. I wouldn't know what to answer for percentage impact on C, confidentiality, I, integrity, and A, availability. Availability, I might stand a chance, but if I can't answer those questions without looking at, up benchmarks, then they don't stand any chance. So you ask the questions that contribute to those things. Whenever you have a conversation about risk, you always say, well, you know, are they handling a lot of data? Are they doing it in an iffy country where we know that there's a bad human rights record or where generally they're bad at putting in place controls? Um, is it, you know, how long can it be down? Well, those are the questions we ask of the people who we need to do this job for us. If we ask these questions properly in plain English with some FAQs and some training, well, my experience is you can get up to a, about an 80% response rate in a vendor governance program of people willingly answering this stuff. And then you've got a baseline of information to plan your next steps, to plan your days. Expanding on that a little bit, that, this is really the extent of the questions you're asking in this 15 minutes with the, with the sub subsequent questions for sort of how many bits of data fall into that category, how many bits of data fall into the sensitive data category, um, which of a predefined list of iffy processing, riskier processing activities came out of data protection regulators, um, how many records is it? We can look at um, types of records and numbers of records. We can look at how much that attracts attackers in our field. IP, are we dealing with bags of secrets, industrial secrets? Um, and these are tailored for a particular business, um, but it really just represents your shoulds, your no-brainers and your tiebreakers for what people would tell you off for if you didn't assess. How do we know they're the right things? Well, we know they're the right things because we look at the stuff it leaves out of scope. And we sample in that and we find out how many that actually want us to kick tires for. Especially when we say if we kick tires for everything, even the stuff this pushes down the priority list, I need four full time people to do the job. This is where we're going with this. It's having a risk based conversation about how many people it takes to actually do the job. And there is more science you can put behind this. Um, only the very maturest businesses who think in terms of risk all the time are likely to be able to ask their people about percentage probability and dollar impact. You need the layer of abstraction I'm talking about, talking about data quantities and types again and availability again, if not. 
that's the only way you're going to get this done. You can hold off and hope that the training and risk is going to mean you're going to get the same answer from two people when you ask them about risk. But I wouldn't hold your breath. I'd want to just actually get some of this data in the bag. What you're looking at now is um, some hardcore statistical analysis that's been done on HIPAA breaches and the SEC findings by a firm called Vivo Security. And it's, it's a reliable correlation. It's the kind of stuff that underpins why we're asking about data and the amount of staff involved. And we know this intuitively. If it passes through more hands, it's more chance that something's going to go wrong. But we, we haven't to this point had a lot of data like this in our industry. Our tail data is so variable, so ropey. Even within firms who've got their act together, there isn't really a tail of data to rely upon for a bunch of this stuff. Even if you're not mature, you're laying the groundwork for maturity because you're gathering the kind of metrics that would go into those more mature risk conversations one day. And this is really reiterating what I said before. If you're going to ask these 15 minute questions and have people answer them, you're going to make every question count. It's not asking nice free form questions where you have a bit of a chat and there's some woolly information. If you're going to put them in scope, you can ask those questions later. If stuff turns out to be risky, they can come and bang in your jaw and say, put them in scope, please. Keep it simple. It should be your procurement person. It should be your architect. It should be your strategy folk who sit in their um, no longer smoke filled rooms, but same thing and brew up bright ideas. They should be able to answer this stuff. A win is when, like I do, after a couple of turns of the handle, someone knocks you in jaw and says, you know, your little questionnaire. I'm going to be doing something in the next six months with a shed load of health data. We think you should really be involved. That that stuff has me running around the office waving my pom poms. I don't know about anybody else. Obviously, that makes me quite sad, but that's a win. That's where we want to be. So what do you do when you actually do this stuff? How does it plug into your actual assessment day? Well, that helps you prioritize those next steps, but it also feeds into not just what kind of assessment you're doing, but how risky stuff is when it's broken. You can use your, reuse your inherent risk for that. And that can help tell you when non-compliance doesn't necessarily equal risk. You'll be familiar with this. You start with that inherent risk. I've got a high rated supplier because they're do, doing shed loads of iffy stuff with shed loads of data and we need it up all the time. So you're gonna go into kick the tires using this control framework or you're gonna do ISO 27. 2002 or you're gonna you're doing it for Fedram or what whatever you're doing whatever your controls framework is you're gonna ask those questions um, let's say it's access management so you've got kind of compliant controls maybe they're doing great generally but they're not doing fantastic with privileged access uh, are they compensatory controls yeah actually every six months they check in for audits they are seeing what's happening with audits so then you find out your residual risk and um, your residual risk means that all those controls in place, is it tolerable? Is it it's not quite compliant? Is it tolerable? That's when going back to your inherent risk counts, because if you've got your main IT outsource partner with broken access controls, it's a big hairy deal. If it's your tiny shop where there's four people and they're not handling a whole shed load that's that risky, it's probably gonna to be tolerable. And you normally end up having those conversations after the fact. You normally get told, well, we've got 256 vulnerabilities. Why haven't you fixed them? And you say, well, actually, about 180 of those aren't that bad because it's not a lot of data. It's not high availability. But that sounds like an excuse. That's a fight after the fact. This is trying to put those conversations up front. Because being at, say, being at risk isn't the same as being at proximate risk. And being afraid isn't the same as being at risk either. I can't even read my own slide. Sorry, guys. Um, even if stuff might go bang, it's not going to go bang tomorrow. And even if stuff goes bang tomorrow, it might not be that bad. It, we need to get into a position where people can actually understand that. We need to get away from trying to shove everything that's gone wrong into a matrix that looks like this. So... This is what we normally put stuff into. Um, again, it's asking people about percentage probability and dollar impact. And when we scratch the surface, there's not really much underneath. That there might be stuff underneath, and you can plug that in, as I said. If you're asking these 15 minute questions, you can back them up with a lot more science over time. But in the interim, while you're working up to that, you can achieve something like this. 
you've put weightings against those questions you asked. You know, a hundred thousand records is 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 very high risk. A hundred thousand sensitive data risk records is even more high risk. It's high risk, and one the next one is very high risk. Depending on which pots they fall into, I've chosen to do this just as a as a count. It, it can tell you where it falls on a heat map. It can give you a feel for where it really should go next. And if you get it wrong, if you're in any doubt, you go back to your subject matter experts. Up until this point, you've been able to automate all this and get people who are not very expensive security professionals involved because we don't have enough hours in the day. You circle back after this and you get them to use some more familiar kind of risk matrix with more or less figures and quantitative science behind it where we really drill into the probability piece if we've got enough data to do it. We drill into direct financial cost. We drill into whether a, a breach involving those inherent risk things like data and availability would, might lead to a final sanction. It might not lead to a final sanction. It might just damage our reputation because it's reportable. Um, it's going to impact people and then we might have a notification cost. And what actual harm does it do to them? Because when it comes to data protection and human rights, we need to know that stuff on behalf of people who might get hurt. That's where you re-inject the expertise. And I mean, how does that look in a process? Let's see. So this is a bit busy, but it starts up the top left there with referral. How do you find out about stuff? You need help to do that. Have people been telling you about it? Is it a reliable feed? Is it a reliable list? Is it maintained? None of that is you. Scoping and triage, your 15 minute questionnaire. You don't do that, they do that with some support. First turn of the handle, you help more people. Second one, maybe they do it themselves. And they're only doing it on a delta. What's changed this year? Really, really light touch, but that gives you an inherent risk estimate. The low stuff, you've agreed up front. We don't put that in scope because that would take, you know, we'd need 10 people in the team if we did the low stuff too. So by default, that's out of scope. Then you've got the medium stuff. You plug your SMEs back in. You plug your experts back in. That stuff either gets put into the pot with a high and very high rated stuff to really have a tire kicking or it gets deferred for now if someone thinks it's suddenly got riskier they can flag it and you can put it back in scope you controls assess you see if you can get the evidence if you can't you've got an engagement risk you've already logged those you've got someone to escalate it to you know who's accountable for that if they can't fix it if it never gets done the inherent risk of that supplier who you haven't been able to properly assess is something that's owned by the person who's been nominated as accountable. And that's written down because if it wasn't documented, it didn't happen. So how do we turn this into a rolling process? How do we really make this work? You've got to make accountability stick. And this is actually something I haven't talked about today, but something is a, a deeply passionate point of mine. We do not have persistent accountability for people who tolerate risks on behalf of the general public then deliver stuff into IoT products or into apps or into algorithms that control, God forbid, public health and welfare. We do not have that stuff persisting. We do not have that demarcation of accountability because it's not in various people's interests to do so and that needs to change. But within our businesses, where they're mature enough to accept that this is necessary, we can make that change. And in the worst, probably least honourable feeling way, at least that documentation can persist for when something does go wrong and somebody has to really find out what's happening in the business. But then you can work out how much it takes to do the job, which is really one of the crown jewels of this whole process. And then you risk and repeat. So this is another view of what a cycle looks like. You're going to check whether your benchmarks are the same. You're going to survey your threat landscape. Are you putting too few in scope, given what's now attractive to attackers, what you're seeing coming down the pipe? Are you doing too few systems? Are you doing too few of your change projects or too few of your suppliers? If so, you change it. Um, have you got more coming into scope? Has your pipeline got bigger? Does that mean you've got enough people to the job, do the job? If you haven't got people to, the, to do the job, you say, we need six more months to get through our list. Or you say... We need you to tolerate the risk of the stuff we can't do. Or you say, we need enough money to get more people on board. Or you might even say, the business that's decided suddenly to engage a whole bunch of new third parties, 
that department pays into your pot so you can get a consultant in to cover that peak in demand. Those are the conversations you can have because you can talk to the people about signing on the dotted line to own the risk of the stuff that can't get done unless they pay to get the assessments working. And then you send things around the horn again. You retriage stuff. It's only 10, 15 minutes to get it done again. Nobody really cares. You need to make get, keep on top of it, but that's great. Um, and your proofs of concept, perhaps you've accepted a risk. But now that proof of concept this year, they're deciding that they're going to use your whole customer database, whereas they weren't going to touch it before. So that's that. And it can feed into something like this. You use your inherent risk indicators to work out what kind of governance happens every year. And like we're saying, do you kick the tires? Do you just triage? How often do you check on accepted risks? But really, this is the crown jewels. When you've done that race, you've worked out what it takes to do the job. You've worked out how many bodies you've got. You've worked out what skills they have. And you've also worked out, based on inherent risk, which ones take longest, because the high rated ones reliably do take longer. So you times up the per supplier activities in this example, it could be per system, the per supplier activities for a high supplier, then the per supplier activities for medium suppliers in scope, the per supplier activities for the low rated suppliers in scope. How many full time staff does that take? And do you have that many? You work out, well, I'm actually two people short. So I need to do less suppliers or I need more people or I need to take longer to do it. These are the kind of conversations your stakeholders have been begging to have. This is the kind of stuff, this is, this is underpinned. You can do all this stuff, you can do it in SharePoint, you can do it in Excel, you can do it in GRC systems where they are, allow you to bespoke that. Um, I'd love someone to build me a front end to do this as standard, but we do this in spreadsheets and it's absolutely A-OK -okay because you can put it into various different governance systems if you want to later on um and then developing apps is a fool's errand oftentimes but if someone wants to give me shed loads of money in a developer fantastic um but really circling back around how did we do do we have the means to find out who's accountable have we found out who's got skin in the game have we found out who can influence people and actually make a change have we made sure they remain accountable over time let's go back have we, especially, given people information? Can we have conversations that allow us to stand? Well, I think we have. I think we can talk to people about how much data is being handled, all the stuff they normally ask, how much data, how many people could be impacted, how availability, what does that uptime mean? Um, have the stakeholders who we needed to get to help us, all those bright ideas factories, all the vendors, all the um, procurement people, done what they need to do? Have they been able to? Because we need to have made sure that it's only those people who are accountable and can influence people and understand it who have to try and make a change. And if we've done all this, maybe we can make a change. And even if we can't, at least we can land accountability with the people who deserve it. And I am not quite sure how long I've spoken to, so I'm sorry if I've gone too long. But I did want to also just highlight this. I've been speaking to a couple of ladies who were involved in Share the Mic in Cyber, who are governance, risk and compliance specialists. Uh, Cassandra Brunetto, who is um, participating in the conference, is Cassie, and Jordan Barnett uh, right, are superb um, governance professionals. And if anybody gets a chance to employ them, please do, because they will whip your governance service into shape in about five seconds flat. Um, and really, I was going, I've maybe gone a bit quick. There's a lot of content here. Like I said, I'm planning on changing, sharing some stuff here if people saw stuff they thought might be useful and they think it can tailor it. There's, a, I'm possibly gonna turn this into a series because there's layers of detail under all of this. But otherwise, I was gonna um, hand this over and see if um, anybody has any questions. Hey, can you hear me, Sarah? Yes, I can. Yes. Great. Uh, wonderful talk. I've been. I was watching the uh, the stage chat the entire time, and so many things that you said resonated with so many people. And uh, I, I kind of pre warned everyone that we might not have time for questions, so I think they uh, kept that in mind. But uh, as I'm talking here, hopefully, if you have any questions and you're in the chat, 
uh, please post them in there. I know there's a little bit of a lag. So um, as someone who teaches cybersecurity and who worked in the field for so long, I have nothing but gratitude and respect for people who do the work that you do, the compliance. Like for me, I get to do talks about breaking into buildings and all the fun, sexy stuff, but really the security that's most important, the work that's being done is being done behind the scenes in this way, through these policies, through these laws. Um, yeah, I'm glad I don't have to do that. I'm glad that's not my specialty. Well, Edward, I'm, I, I, it's great to hear that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I loved being in diagnosis mode. I absolutely adored the break fix part of it. Um, I am, I'm a crisis manager and diagnostician at heart. If you give me a naughty logical problem on a computer, I'm happy as Larry. I literally throw myself on my sword because what I was seeing was the guys who needed to do the creative stuff because we had things that we didn't necessarily have a well-formulated way to deal with. Uh, the mm -hmm. novel attacks and indications of compromise we, we hadn't quite got a handle on. Um, but every time there was an audit point or a new regulatory requirement, it just stripped away all the hours in the day. Um, we became or we were purely reactive and all we could do was come up for air long enough to shout about not having enough people but never make a case well enough to actually get the extra bodies we needed and then just we became noise so i have some <laughs> questions here um a lot of people mentioned uh wanting to see the slides or to maybe see a recording a lot i know that we're not saving this one but there i think when you mentioned doing this as a series you're going to get nothing but an overwhelming support for that so uh, uh one question from the chat when is your book of illustrations coming out i love your whimsy and knowledge <laughs> you have a book of illustrations coming out soon I need a ghostwriter. I'm one of those people who that, that I, I'm not. I'm not a great finisher for giant things like books. But if someone let me talk a book at them, we could probably get it done quite quickly. <laughs> I agree. Another question for someone who's more a hands-on security person who's trying to wrap her arms around GRC. Any books or resources you would recommend to get started? Um, I could probably share some of that, but it's, it's some of the stuff around ISO 27001, although it's only as good as the people who practice it, but it is an information, man sorry, information security management system. The governance stuff in NIST and ISO 27001 from somebody who does it in a really easily consumable way talks about the kind of steps I have. You'll find hooks to hang what I've talked off all the way through that. Mm -hmm. What I've done is try to drill down to the absolute basics that make the most difference. But there's a lot of good stuff in there to get a feel for it. And I'm I'm happy. I've got my own website. I've written about a lot of this stuff on as well, which is actually is not introspectives. It's infospectives. If I type it in chat, you can copy it. Um, yeah. Um, Infospectives.co.uk, and then a whole bunch of stuff if you search for event governance in, in particular with a whole bunch of links in there to the standards I've talked about. Okay, I'm going to paste this in the stage chat. Um, we, we actually had a couple of other questions if you want to uh, sure. take a look at them. So do you deal with ransomware risk at all? Um, what would you recommend for small businesses and companies who cannot afford the manpower money to for dedicated risk analysis? So there's a, maybe a couple different yeah. questions in there. Yeah, I mean, in terms of ransomware risk, none of what I've, I've talked about today is, is touched um, on actual technical controls requirement. What I've talked about today would be um, flagging up the things that are most vulnerable to ransomware risk. It would be flagging up the thing where you would be doing the hardest core of assessment on them. You would expect to drive out controls with that kind of threat in mind during that follow, that next phase of activity. Um, what this is, I would defer to someone like yourself, Edward, to have that technical specifics conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, what I would be doing is making space for you to have that conversation properly rather than answering a shed load of daft questions that someone in the business could answer for you. Um, this is why I'm not the governance person's governance person. I'm the techie's governance person. <laughs> but um, for a small business, there is actually 
um, a whole other talk I do, which angles this towards micro businesses and startups, because there are core elements of this that you can do at tiny scale. And it, all it needs is a spreadsheet or SharePoint in your Office 365. And you can lay the groundwork for all of this with only a few words and only a few questions. And you can grow it as the business grows. Um, and what it actually this would show up as a really robust risk management process with very little effort. It's, it's done right. And I'm quite happy to talk about that time. OK, you can reach out to me via LinkedIn or reach out to me via Twitter or or, or, or whatever. I'm planning in other talks over time. That's great. And I did post those links in the chat for anyone who's interested. Um, I guess one final question. Uh, let's see here. And this one is kind of something that I'm interested in. So we spoke briefly about ransomware. We didn't get into the technicals, but the question is, should there be more laws on the books to prevent companies from paying ransom? And this is something that, you know, when I teach my students about ransomware, I teach them that the targets of these different groups, you know, if they target a hospital, a hospital is following best practices. A hospital has you know, robust backup strategies, and they can restore all that data without paying the ransom, but they can't afford the time necessary for recovery like that. They have to pay the ransom. Like if you target a police station or a dispatch or, you know, any one of these government agencies that are mission critical, I mean, they have no choice but to uh, pay the ransom. So would what the question about uh, should there be more laws on the books to prevent uh, companies no, no there shouldn't be no they, there absolutely should not be more laws um what there should be is people um as i said driving out with a focus on their crown jewels data understanding how long it can be down exactly what you said about hospitals um yeah. when they when they work out their risk tolerance for that be, being down in a ransomware scenario um they need to then have on hand um the specialist um responders that they can they can pull in at the drop of a hat to advise right. them on the specific kind of ransomware and the specific scenario they find themselves in. It will be absolutely situation dependent on it's mm -hmm. sometimes a given day, especially in those kind of national infrastructure hospital scenarios. Um, but but the, the very least, this kind of process, what it can do is engage the stakeholders with the accountability to put the money into setting those detective responsive measures in place. Yeah. The sooner you know about it, the sooner you can respond. The sooner you can drive out a justification for how much is going to get destroyed. And then you can justify the budget. And in in typical models, people try. And as I said, I kept saying about percentage probability and dollar impact. That stuff is largely noise these days. But if you're talking about amounts of patients, if you're talking right. about, you know, amounts of critical infrastructure you can't access for how long. That's the conversation that makes the it framing is so important, I think. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I know that we're about out of time. So I just want to personally thank you for your talk. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, the Diane Initiative appreciates this. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, please connect uh, with Sarah afterwards uh, in the chat. And uh, if we need to, we can set up a breakout room for I saw I saw now that we started asking questions, there's so many have been coming into the chat. So uh, we'll, we'll do our best to get to those uh, off stream. Well, if you can lift those, we'll, and we, I, I'm going to go and start a session. I will start a session, and you can let. And if I let you about it, can you let folk know? Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Okay. So keep an eye on the event chat, and uh, I'll advertise the breakout room in there after this chat, and we'll keep the conversation going. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Thank you for coming along. Okay. Bye for now.